For the last year, Doa has been getting treatment, so-called resilience training, building her confidence, her ability to cope with stress. New research by the charity Save the Children suggests such help is needed by hundreds of thousands more children in Gaza. Save the Children interviewed 150 children for their research, 95% of whom reported at least one of four key symptoms, hyperactivity, depression, aggression, or a wish to be alone. Experts tell us that anxiety is the overarching problem prompted by conflict, the poor economy, and the continuing deterioration of life in Gaza. أنا بحب المدرسة كتير لأنه طموح إني كفي دراستي وسمعت كتير إنه سلاح البنت هو العلم وأنا بدي هالسلاح ما بدي أطلع من دراستي. مؤسسة نقاط الطفل تقدم خدمات كتير مهمة للأطفال والمجتمع، كونت صداقات جديدة وتعرفت على مدربات جداد وزاد زدت ثقتي بنفسي. أحلامي بدي أصير صحفية. His name is Hamza Ali Muhammad. He's two years old from the Palestinian city of Ramallah in the West Bank. After months without her, he's finally back in his mother's arms on his way home. It's been a short ride, but a very long journey. It began in late February when Hamza was brought to Israel for life-saving cardiac surgery by Save a Child's Heart. Based at Wolfson Medical Center in Cholon, over the last 25 years, this international humanitarian initiative has saved the lives of almost five and a half thousand youngsters from developing regions around the world. Hamza's surgery went well, but his recovery was far from routine. He spent weeks in intensive care as doctors and nurses fought to save his life. While he was on life support, his mother had to visit her other children back home in Ramallah. And it happens to be that the coronavirus hit us all and the lockdown was imposed on Israel from the Israeli side and in the Palestinian Authority. Weeks later, when Hamza could finally breathe on his own, his family was still stuck in Ramallah. He awoke surrounded by strangers, but not for long. The entire Israeli medical team stepped in to fill the gap and they made sure that Hamza never lost sight of his real family. <laughs> The void was filled, and this is really amazing story, uh, by all the staff here, the doctors and the nurses, that took him as if he was their own child. Bye bye. Finally, after two months, it was time for Hamza to say goodbye. It's only an hour or so from Kulon, across the checkpoint to the West Bank. But it's been a very long time since Hamza's mother has held him in her arms. Continuing international travel restrictions are making Save a Child's Heart's work more challenging than ever. But nothing can stop this life-saving mission. Thanks to continuing support from around the world, long after COVID-19 is gone, one Palestinian child and his family will carry some lasting memories from a special place that's very close to home. I would like to introduce my two guests today on the Israel Connection. Uh, Jason Lee is the country director for Save the Children operations in the Palestinian territories and has worked in East Timor, Papua New Guinea, Afghanistan, Sierra Leone and Yemen, all wonderfully safe places, uh, I, I can't say. Daron Lazarus is the CEO of the Australian arm of Save a Child's Heart, an organisation 
which operates across the world, treating children suffering from congenital and rheumatic heart disease who have little access to care in their own countries. So we're going to start off, Jason, if, with you, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, can you please give us an indication of uh, what is the, the mandate of Save the Children and how does Save the Children go about improving the lot of children in the Palestinian territories where you have responsibility personally uh, as, uh, as the country director there? Yep. Um, so Save the Children, we're an organisation that has been around for, I think, over 100 years. We work in over 100 countries and basically we have global breakthroughs that we want to reach by 2030. And this essentially means that no child should die before their fifth birthday due to uh, preventable illnesses, that all children should have access to education, all children are kept healthy and protected. So that's the global mandate for Save the Children. And we're basically a child rights organisation that looks to protect and uphold the rights of children, no matter where they are. Specifically in the occupied Palestinian territory, um, we work in both the West Bank and Gaza, and we've got a multitude of programs ranging from education. So um, together with UNICEF, Save the Children are the co-lead for the education cluster. And for your listeners out there, basically in any humanitarian crisis, we have what we call clusters, um, thematic clusters. So for example, education, food, security, um, health and nutrition. And these clusters oversee and coordinate all of these interventions within that particular thematic area. So together with UNICEF, we look at the education. So globally, Save the Children and UNICEF co-chair the education cluster in any humanitarian emergency. So understandably, our ed education program is pretty large. And as we've seen with COVID-19 and the impact that this has had on children being able to access education, there's been a lot of work on this area. So what we do is, again, we support the Ministry of Education, making sure that the curriculum is up to date so that children are actually able to access education. Now, unfortunately, in, in parts of Palestine, for example, Gaza, there, there really isn't any possibility of having remote learning. Like I know here in Australia, in Sydney and Melbourne now, where we're going through lockdowns, a lot of the schools are closed uh, and a lot of kids are sort of joining classes online, um, learning remotely. Now, a lot of children in, in, in Palestine don't have this luxury. If you can imagine, you've got multiple kids in one household. If you're lucky, you'll have one laptop and you've got really no internet access in Gaza as well. So it's really difficult for children to access remote learning. Um, Gaza as well is one of the most densely populated areas in the world. Um, and so, you know, you really have no space. You've got all these lots of families living together, multiple generations of families living in small spaces, a lot of poverty, high un unemployment rates, and children trying to access education. This is virtually impossible. So with Save the Children, we're doing a lot of work to try and see how do we support these kids so that they don't, they don't drop out. Because one thing that is quite critical, and we're all seeing globally, is the protective element of education. I mean, if you're really serious about providing a future for children, they have to be educated. Um, they have to be provided the foundations for learning the basic literacy and numeracy that will allow them to go on and get jobs, to go to universities, to do more studies. We also find that education is quite protective in the sense that it protects young girls from getting married early. It protects children from going to child labor. I mean, if you don't have schools, you've got really, really poor economic conditions, you've got families that don't have enough to, to eat, a lot of children get sent off to work. A lot of, children, a lot of girls get married early off. Um, a lot of children, particularly, I mean, I was working in Yemen as well, and we saw that a lot of children get recruited um, for fighting because there's just no options for them. So it's quite critical that we protect schools, we protect children, and we allow them to continue and, and live a life like they normally would anywhere else in the world. Um, so as I said, you know, in OPT, we've got a huge range of projects, and I've just mentioned education one of them. Obviously, protection is quite critical. We know that the issue of the um, Israel-Palestine file has been going for over 70 years now, and it's that's a protracted protection crisis. So a lot of children, particularly in the West Bank, both in Gaza, and you also see within parts of Israel themselves, there's been large numbers of violence in the recent months. And a lot of these children are exposed to this violence. So it's how do we keep them safe? How do we ensure that children have the right to express their voices, to be heard, but in a safe way so that we don't put them in harm's way? And I think it's quite critical as well. 
Um, so those are some of the just the programs that we're running. Obviously, we have a lot of others in food security and livelihoods, in water and sanitation as well, which is quite important during COVID, and of course, health and nutrition. Okay, so we might get to uh, speak about some of those uh, other areas that you were involved with, uh, perhaps uh, as we go down the line, uh, Jason. Now let's uh, give Daron Lazarus a chance to tell us about uh, what he does in his spare time. Well, not exactly uh, yeah. how much time you spend uh, in your role as the CEO of Save a Child's Heart, but do you want to tell us about the work you do there and um, how does your organisation go about improving uh, the welfare of children, Doron? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I just also want to start um, by commending Jason on his vocation because the more humanitarians there are out there and the more people who who care, uh, especially for children, irrespective of where it might be or what it might be, um, certainly uh, bodes well for a, a brighter future for the world. So, uh, you know, I think we share a passion for a passion for care and we do what we do because we care. Save a Child's Heart um, is an organisation that started 25 years ago and it was started in uh, a hospital in South Tel Aviv in Cholon, which is um, one of the uh, more marginalised areas of Tel Aviv. Um, and how it basically started was a doctor operating in that hospital, a surgeon who was a paediatric cardiac surgeon um, who operated on children locally and understood that there was a huge um, and desperate need um, for children all around the world to um, have access to uh, critical paediatric cardiac care. He had been exposed to it. He'd been in different countries and decided that he and a few colleagues that he roped in to say, we surely should be able to provide a service where we can identify these areas where children um, with uh, congenital rheumatic heart disease um, who have no access to critical care can be treated, bring them into Israel and actually treat them here. And so what he did, he got some um, other physicians together um, and that process continues to this day. So all of the, um, the organization now, 25 years later. Israeli humanitarian NGO Save a Child's Heart performed its 5,555th life-saving procedure last week. Around half of those procedures are dedicated to treating Palestinian patients. The organization not only brings children from the Palestinian territories and abroad to Israel for life-saving treatments, it also trains doctors within these regions to perform the surgeries locally, learning directly from Israeli health experts. Now for this milestone procedure, the NGO treated a five-month-old Palestinian boy from Gaza named Mahmoud, suffering from life-threatening illnesses. Mahmoud was brought to Wolfson Medical Center in Cholon for the treatment, where he underwent surgery to save his life. In the next month or so, we'll have operated on or treated our 6,000th child. Of those 6,000 children, about 3,000, 50%, and this is an ongoing basis, are from uh, Gaza and the Palestinian Authority. Uh, the other 3,000 are from another 60-odd regions and countries around the world. The uh, vast majority, in fact, many of those countries are, 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 um, are based in Africa, throughout the Middle East, Syria, Iraq. Um, Eastern Europe, um, you mentioned East Timor, we've had children from East Timor, Fiji, anywhere where there's children who are suffering um, and require critical care. And so what we basically do is we have uh, doctors who operate, as I said, pro bono, none of them get paid um, uh, by Save a Child's Heart to do what they do. They all operate pro bono. Uh, we have multiple screening missions a year where we send out um, a medical team to these regions um, and they screen the children, um, work out those that need to be operated on, some very urgently and some who can wait. And then we go about bringing them into Israel with a carer, whether it be a parent, often not, as Jason referred to, parents can't travel because they need to be working and earning money for the family. It's sometimes a guardian or a grandmother or grandfather. Um, bring them into Israel provide the life-saving treatment for the children. We put them up in a children's home for two or three months sometimes, ensuring that they are um, well enough and okay to return to their home countries. Um, and that is something that we do literally on an ongoing basis. So on average, we operate or treat a child every single day in, in our organisation, which is the Sylvan Adams um, Children's Hospital in, uh, in Cholon, as I mentioned. Uh, and the other arm of what we do is we actually have a scholarship program, a medical training scholarship program, where we bring 
physicians um, and, and medical professionals from these same regions. We bring them into Israel to train them in pediatric cardiology or, or, or um, to be anaesthetists or, or other related fields because the ultimate goal is to train them so that they can return to their own communities and become self-sufficient. You know, we can create healthier communities that become self-reliant because that's ultimately the end game for us is while we would um, continue to treat children in Israel, if we can set up pediatric cardiac centers of excellence all around the world, um, then certainly that's a big part of our charter and our mandate. Um, for example, um, we now have a pediatric cardiac surgeon operating in Ethiopia, uh, a population of, of 110 million, um, and he is the only. So in a population of 110 million, 35 million children under the age of 15, he is the only pediatric cardiac surgeon um, trained by Save a Child's Heart um, in, Australia, in, in Israel. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just a, one example of, of many. And, and I think certainly we're now training the same medical teams in places like Zanzibar and, and Zambia. Um, and in terms of, of Gaza and the Palestinian Authority, um, uh, again, we currently have five um, trainees with us. Um, in Israel, um, ranging from pediatric cardiac, again, to an etiology, um, and that is an ongoing program. Um, and basically what we have set up to do, as I said, over and above treating children, ensuring that every child across the world has access to critical care that they need. Um, it is also about creating um, a unity, a dialogue um, in, in real and, 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 and uh, an example. It's not, it's not rhetoric. It's not uh, words its deeds and its actions. And that's what we go about every single day in Israel is dealing with our um, Palestinian counterparts, um, both in the medical training field and in terms of treating children. So uh, Gazan and Palestinian, um, the Palestinian children come in each and every day into Israel. It's an ongoing thing. We have wonderful relationships with the um, health ministries in both those areas, as well as doctors. Um, and that is a very big part, as I said, 50% of, of the children that we treat. Um, the new hospital I mentioned has just been built um, and we hope to double our capacity. We currently, as I said, operate on 350 to 400 children a year and we're hoping to increase that to 800 to 1,000 children a year and continue on with the same uh, programs uh, in, in all the areas I've mentioned. Um, and here in Australia, I, I run the Australian arm, which is fundraising and advocacy because we have the will, we have the want. Um, the doctors are there, the physicians are all there doing what they do, and it's just a matter of, uh, as Jason would know well, having the resources and the funds to continue to do what we do. And that's, uh, that's Save a Child's Heart. Well, that's uh, a in very interesting uh, account from uh, both of you of, uh, of the work that you're doing. Indeed. Now, I decided to invite you, Jason, to speak with me after I read an article that uh, was published by SBS titled uh, Politics Aside with Abandoned Children in the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. Now, this article has been backed up by a 20-page report titled Hope Under the Rubble. So you've uh, provided a report uh, as well, uh, which has been prepared by the Palestinian Territory Office, which I would shortly like to discuss uh, with you, Jason, in more detail. Now, in the SBS article, you wrote that Save the Children, together with your partners, and you've mentioned those in your introduction, is helping children and their families impacted by demolition with psychosocial support, including individual and group counselling sessions. Do you want to explain, please, uh, with some examples, what your office in the Palestinian Territories is doing in this, uh, in this specific regard? Yep. So the report that you uh, referred to was uh, a study that we did in, I think it was December till January of this year. So December of last year to January of this year, where we interviewed over 300, 200, I can't remember the number two, I think it was 317 families um, that had been experienced demolition within the last 10 years. And basically to get a sense of what the impact was on children. Um, and what we found is that, um, of course, you know, besides the immediate trauma of losing a home, and we all know how important this is, particularly with COVID, where all of us are stuck at home, it's, it's really a sanctuary that we need to be in. Um, so we interviewed these kids and asked them, you know, what was it like, what they went through, and the, re the results were quite startling, where I think for me, the saddest thing was that eight out of 10 children, so vast majority, felt that they had been abandoned by the families, their parents, 
um, authorities, even the international community. I think this was a little bit worrying because, you know, it showed that a lot of these children had lost hope for future. Um, again, huge numbers. So again, three out of five of them had the demolitions impact the education. And we, we all know how important it is for children to continue education. And of course, you know, the feelings of anxiety or feeling detached. I think, you know, we had a huge number of children, seven out of 10 of them saying that they felt disconnected. They absolutely felt, they felt withdrawn, removed, they suffered from anxiety. Um, bedwetting was quite common, the feelings of anger and, and frustrations. And so what we immediately did was uh, we identified these children through our partners, we looked at immediate psychosocial support. So it's looking at providing counselors, providing social workers, um, psychologists to actually talk to these children, to allow them to express their feelings, to allow them to actually see what they're doing and try and find ways to actually support therapy for those children. Now, of course, this is just a band-aid because whenever you demolish a home, a child goes through the same thing. And of course, we run there and we try and provide support for the child. We try and provide support for the family um, because it's not it's just the child. I mean, we spoke to the caregivers as well, so the parents and asked the parents, you know, and as you can imagine, three out of four parents felt a great deal of shame, a great deal of anger and, 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 and in, essentially incompetent because they felt that they could not protect the children. And these feelings of, of, of shame, of anger, further exacerbated the economic, um, acti- uh, I guess, the, um, the livelihood of these families, because I think it was six out of the 10 families that we interviewed said that their economic conditions had gotten a lot worse. Um, obviously, they lost an asset, so they no longer have a home. But also it impacted their um, their jobs, the ability to go get jobs, continue work, and this led to a vicious cycle, you know, of had not not being able to provide for the family, feeling distant from their children. I mean, one out of the three of the of the of the parents said that they actually felt emotionally disconnected from their children because of all the stress of what they're going through. So we see that this process has such significant impact on children. Now, it's really heartbreaking for me because Save the Children, all we could do immediately was provide the psychosocial support. And I know it's really important. Um, but again, I feel like we're just a Band-Aid. We're trying to make things stop from getting worse, but we really have to try and address the root causes. And so what we try and do is refer the families to some of our other programs that look at, okay, can we support the family with livelihood options? Can we provide the families with at least some cash so they can find alternative places to live? They can pay for food, making sure that the kids continue education wherever possible. So supporting the kids to to, to stay in school, to keep learning, um, giving them the psychosocial support so that it meets the immediate anxiety, the feelings of depression, the sadness that that these children have, but also supporting the families to try and maintain the family unit. Certainly sounds like uh, quite a handful it keeps the teams very busy <laughs> and our partners as well. It certainly sounds like quite a handful, as you've uh, just been saying. Coming back uh, to you, Duran, perhaps you can uh, illuminate um, in some detail uh, the work you're doing, in particular in the uh, in Gaza and the Palestinian territories. I, in your introduction, it was uh, somewhat uh, interesting to hear that um, virtually half of your activities are devoted to... Uh, mm to helping uh, the Palestinians, which is uh, quite an extraordinary effort. And I came across an article of yours uh, that uh, about your core activities, that how it, they were impacted during COVID. Um, and you were bringing children to the Wolfson Medical Center for life-saving heart procedures. Now, since 1996, Palestinian children from Gaza and the West Bank have been introduced to the Save a Child's Heart volunteer medical team at a free weekly cardiac clinic for Palestinian families. And through war and peacetime, the program has been maintained as a cornerstone of Save a Child's Heart and, and your bridge building mission. Perhaps you want to amplify what, uh, what you're doing uh, in, in, in practical terms and tell us uh, and in great emphasis uh, on uh, how much of an impact that's making on, uh, on the Palestinian people themselves. Uh, with pleasure. Um, yes. So, well, well, and truly, over half of our um, our, our our patients are uh, from um, Gaza, the the Palestinian Authority, and as I said, that will will continue on. Um, so, in terms of of the day to day process, so it's an interesting one. You talk about you know even at times of conflict, and and Jason, I think, put it so well. At the end of the day, 
um, when children are suffering, you know, over and above anything else, whatever, irrespective of what cause, what, you know, yes, the root cause is there. And sometimes we can resolve those and other times we can't. And we deal with a very specific um, um, part of that, which is, which is life-threatening, a, a life-threatening illness. Um, and at the end of the day, and that's how we view ourselves, is these are children and this is a life beyond anything else. Um, and that is what drives us, and that's what drives us on a daily basis. So, as I mentioned, we have uh, um, not only the health ministries of, of both areas that we work with, but we have a number of the key hospitals and doctors um, who Save a Child's Heart works with on a daily basis. And what will happen is, just to give you an idea of, of the process, a child will... Um, will present to a doctor because the, the parents are concerned that something's not right. Um, often it's, it's sleep, it's lethargy. There is you know, a number of symptoms. Sometimes it's very obvious. Uh, it's, at, it's before birth that gets diagnosed or, or soon afterwards. They present to their doctors. Their doctors understand that this is a, a something that requires um, a very high level of care and, ex and, and expertise. Um, they immediately contact Save a Child's Heart um, and our, our colleagues there in Israel. Um, they then uh, discuss the patients. Often there's um, um, documentation or, or reports that are sent across. And then what uh, happens each and every day, um, or certainly every week, there is there a screening and uh, there are screenings for Palestinian children. So every um, every week or so they come in through, through the checkpoints into um, the hospital where the doctors at uh, Save a Child's Heart um, screen all of the children. Um, and then diagnose and decide what the next steps are. Some of the children who are acutely unwell actually stay and are treated there and then, whether it be a, a treatment, um, catheterizations, or, or full surgery. Um, and often the, the parent will, will stay with them, uh, or others will travel backwards and forwards between um, the Palestinian Authority, Gaza, back and forward into Israel um, for treatment. It's a chilly morning here at the Israel-Gaza border. We're waiting for six children to come through the crossing. All of these children have heart problems and they're coming to Israel to have operations with an organization called Save a Child's Heart. This organization gives free heart operations to children all over the world. Without these operations, these children probably wouldn't make it into adulthood. What's amazing about what we're about to see is that this is happening all the time. It doesn't matter what the situation is with the conflict between Israel and Gaza. Thousands of children are coming across to Israel for treatment. Every Tuesday we have here at the Wolfson Medical Center a free cardiology clinic for children from the West Bank and from Gaza. 20, 30 kids come every Tuesday, no matter what's going on around, to be examined here at this clinic by the Israeli doctors of Save a Child's Heart. And as I said, that's an ongoing uh, program. Um, it includes the doctors that are training with us. They're often part of that. Uh, we have the nurses um, in the hospital. And if you ever see um, Save a Child's Art Hospital, it is literally um, everyone and anyone from anywhere, irrespective of religions. There are multiple religions, multiple faiths um, from, from all over Israel who work there. Um, critical for our work because some of the children and parents do not speak uh, Hebrew. And um, so if there's, you know, Arabic spoken to make sure the communication is clear. Um, and as I said, this is an ongoing process. Some of these children come for a, a treatment or a surgery at a young age and then they return two or three years later because they need a further intervention. And this is ongoing. And, and as someone in Israel that I spoke to, um, you know, really all we're working towards is a positive outcome, positive dialogue, positive outcome. Um, and there was a recent study done just to, um, as a little bit of an insight into, you know, are we making a difference? You know, I'm a very, um, you know, while it's not part of our charter per se, thankfully it's a, it's a positive outcome, is the open dialogue and building bridges to peace and build, building understanding. Because when you have a child in your hands that is unwell and you have a doctor there and a nurse, irrespective of their background, and they're looking after this child, nothing else matters. And there can't help be, uh, you know, a sense of unity and a sense of working together. Um, and there was a, a large uh, survey done. I think, again, similar, it was 300 or 400 families um, since they were treated in Israel. And these were um, Palestinian families and were asked their feelings prior to the operation and, and, and post. And uh, 80 to 90 percent of them came back and said, that we have a much warmer and more positive feeling towards at least 
working with our colleagues, our comrades, our, our friends in Israel than we did prior to this, because they saw, to your point, out of, of a living example of how things actually can work and work together and had much more favourable um, outlook, a more positive outlook, irrespective of the challenges that we all face. And this is, as I said, this is ongoing. This will remain uh, very much a part of, of what we do. I hope that that covers some of your, your question. Yeah, that's great. Uh, okay, well, I think our listeners have got a really good idea now of, uh, of your, both of your organisations and the sort of work you do.